current fall lecture. We started with Dr. Tonsus, who is talking to Elizabeth, uh, uh, at the waste uh, project. So we, these are talks about work people in our context do. So it started with Professor Tonsus. It, it continued with Monica Gallo and engineering education. And now we have uh, Dr. Woodson speak about his research. And I will very quickly uh, just outline that. Thomas started as an electrical engineer. And as so many uh, engineers, he started with an interest in the gadgets of engineering. So he wanted to build the newest and use the newest and probably also play with the newest things that were around. And then he studied and he got to the university and he uh, looked around and, uh, and somehow he realized that actually his main or his stronger interest would be to see what technology does to society. And does it do what technology could or should do to society, namely improving society or not? And that became then basically a question that is in the title of our department, right? Technology and society. And in order to follow, I mean, having the, having the electrical engineering background, but to follow this interest, he studied what is called science policy. Uh, because that's a, a natural <coughs> consequence that you say, look, I mean, maybe technology and science and science and technology needs also a little bit of nudging in a certain direction so that it becomes useful for society because when you look who uses technology who advances technology well universities do but they have academic interests so the academic interests may not necessarily they are always uh, as far as uh, universities go, they want to get uh, grants, patents, things like that. They have academic interests and they are disciplinary very often. But if you are interested, like Thomas became interested in problems, problems are not driven by disciplines. Problems are messy. And problems need many disciplines to solve. And, uh, and if that's the case, then maybe something like policy direction could move uh, science and technology advancement in a direction that is fulfilling this interest in improving society. So that was basically a kind of maturing of your thinking and interests from being focused on technology in opening up, focusing on technology and society and bringing in the one of the <coughs> tools that human societies have, namely policy, policy making, and that's then called science and technology policy. And there are also fields like the science, SDS studies are in, 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 in that area, but that is basically his, I don't know how to call it, his awakening to technology and society. And uh, so in that course, he got a PhD from Georgia Institute of Technology in Science Policy. Also, when you look at uh, problems in the world, uh, you may look at problems in particular parts of the world. And that's also what Thomas did. He looked at how technology and advancement of technology works in a world that is called a developing world, Africa. So he worked in had experience in South Africa and in Burkina Faso, which is uh, uh, Northwest Africa. Uh, and, and that is something that's extremely uh, valuable. If you grow up, if we grow up in an advanced society, I mean, I grew up in Germany, but if you grew up in the United States, if you never leave advanced societies, you never understand what people struggle with. Uh, you also never really fully understand what is your real background because you are always inside. So you have to step outside. So this stepping outside that Thomas did, 
was, I assume, this is just not, <laughs> was very important for you yeah. because that gives you also a handle on what really works. I mean, when I was younger, we, did, we had a project in Europe on, it was after the Second World War, France and Germany had always fought, and we did some research on alternative developments in France, Germany, and Italy. And we encountered one group that was working in the south of France, and they were developing technology for Africa. And one of the insights, and I, I visited them, they, one of the insights was that the technology that engineers develop is always highly developed, highly advanced. And so, and then they pride themselves, the countries that give development help, that they give advanced technology. But there's a problem, one problem, there are many problems. One problem is that in order to repair advanced technology, you need advanced degrees, advanced tools and all that. You need to have the capacity in the country to repair that technology. So if you get a turbine that's highly advanced, uh, but you can never open that and fix that thing, then once it's broken, it lies there. And these guys in the south of France, they use rear axles of VWs to build turbines because the rear axles of VWs and other cars are lying in heaps in Africa because everybody takes everything apart and, and piles it up and you repair it. And that's so, I guess that was probably also an, an, of strong impact yeah. to you. Okay, enough. Um, last thing, uh, uh, Thomas is also involved in assets. That is a program that helps transfer students. And uh, with other words, that's uh, transfer students that come from community colleges to the university. And uh, that's a funded program. And that is uh, in the context of STEM education. So his interest reaches also out to STEM education. And today, he will talk about BIC, not with a, with a G, but with a C, yep. Broader M Impact Criterion. The NSF, that's our supreme funder in, in the College of Engineering, the NSF wants all PIs to add broader impact to their proposals. Because the NSF also realizes it's not enough. Uh, or as we say, engineering has become much too important to be left to the engineers. They have to think beyond the narrow focus on advancement of a discipline and technology. And as you can imagine, if you add to a discipline or a field that gets funded for its excellence, a broader impact, which is in the title of that, then the PIs that write these grants think, so what can I add to that that makes that, I mean, that makes sense. And it's, but it's like a second thought very often. Um, and now he, Thomas, is engaging in a funded project by the NSF to actually probe into that uh, broader impact criterion. So yes, this is very nice that you have that incentive and that you have that interest in having a broader impact of your research, but also question, does it do what it promises? And that's what you will tell us more about today. Yes. yes, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Wolf. I do appreciate you allowing me to speak today. I know most of you here, but there's a few people who haven't had a chance to interact with very much. So, let's see. Um, this is my title of my talk, The Science, Technology, and Innovation Benefit Marginalized Groups. And kind of the structure of my talk, um, I'll give a little bit about my background. Wolf actually did a little bit of that in, in the introduction, but I'll talk about my background a little bit. Um, a little bit about science, technology, policy, kind of the whole field as a whole. And then I'll get into my study on broader impact. So they'll kind of start broad and work my way down. So hopefully, I know we have some people here who have, you know, PhDs in science, technology, policy, do this all the time. And there's other people in the room who are just brand new to this field. So I'll kind of just try to st strike a nice balance between those two things. So first, as Wolf was talking about my background, 
Uh, my first degree was, was electrical engineering from Princeton, and my PhD is from Georgia Tech in public policy with an emphasis on science policy. So, um, and now, of course, I'm here at um, Tech and Society, and so this is a very unique department, as you probably all know. And there's very few places that do science technology policy in one of the few departments, so it's kind of a nice fit between my two interests to work here. I've been here for about five years now, so um, again, for most people that know me, but for some of the people, I've been here for about five years in faculty. So why it's kind of uh, this mix between engineering and policy, it kind of, it's kind of a little cartoon to see the forest for the trees. As you know, the engineers are very focused on a particular problem. When I was an engineer, I did a lot with making microchips, so solid state devices, so making the chips, making flexible electronic devices, a great field, um, but you're very focused on one problem. And then as Wolf was saying, I had a few chances to work overseas, um, Nigeria, South Africa, there's some work in Kenya as well. And that kind of brought me to some of these other questions about how does technology affect the belt. And one example I often give is when I was working in Nigeria, um, every single day at 2 p.m. electricity would go out. And of course, you know, all your research, experiments, and products would be destroyed at 2 p.m. basically. And so that's not necessarily a technical problem. I mean, you can provide reliable energy, but there's some policy problem that's causing this trouble there. So kind of that kind of spark thinking about technology and policy and linking those two things together. So some of the things I, I do, um, one thing I study is emerging technologies. And so in the past I've studied things like nanotechnology. I've also studied 3D printing. So how do these new and emerging technologies affect development? Um, this product, I'm talking about broader impacts, and so I'll talk more about the broader impact criteria in a second. I spend a lot of time discussing engineering education. So how can we improve the way we train and teach engineers? Um, I think everyone in this department understands that there's some problems with traditional engineering education and how we approach it. And so how can we make it better? And also STEM diversity. So how can we increase the number of people and the types of people involved in, in STEM fields? And so this getting involved with one of the projects was the um, assets program, which is helping community college students transfer to Stony Brook University. I'm also involved with NSBE, which is the National Society for Black Engineers. I'm the faculty advisor for there. And then one's a few different other communities and boards throughout the um, college, but um, diversity with STEM as well. So that's another passion I have in mind. And so then, of course, one question I often ask this thing is, what is science and what is policy? I kind of do science policy. Um, you know, oftentimes science, we think of, you know, the, if you go to your high school chemistry class, you do those experiments, we think about the hypothesis testing, you have a hypothesis, you see what's going on, you test it. Um, policies, we think of, you know, all the government, and I think currently it's not it's controversial to say the government in America is crazy right now, right? So we think of craziness, we think of messiness, that's oftentimes associated with policy. And, you know, so we think of, talk about things like positive versus normative. You know, positive is the science side of things, it's, you know, stack base, it's based on observations, and it's value neutral. I think if you ever have a chance to take a science, a philosophy of science class, you'll quickly break some of these things down. A science may not be as value neutral as you may expect, but again, that's a science, philosophy of science class. Um, if you want to take that. But again, in general, we say it's science is value neutral, as opposed to policy, which is very normative. It's these rights and wrongs, so, you know, it's very much based on your ethics, you know. One group says this is a good thing to do, and so we pursue that. In other words, you know, sometimes we use science to back up our positions, but who cares what the science says? Let's do what we feel is right or wrong. So that's often how policy is viewed. So I'm kind of linking these two things together. This is one definition of science policy. Uh, science technology is concerned with the allocation of resources for scientific and technical development and use of science in connection with problems in the public sector. So that's one definition by Deborah Stein. Um, you know, it's a pretty good definition um, that I like to use. Um, here's some recent headlines doing science policy to see how where, where I sit in this world. This came up with The Economist, I think maybe about a, a year ago, Modern Love, Dating in the Digital Age. So you obviously see some science here, right? This is digital age technologies, and then there's dating. So how does, what kind of policies should be put in place? Um, should the government get involved with this at all? Or should we just let it be wild, wild west? You know, at some point, there probably is some policies there with protecting children from you know, predators and those type of things. And so you got to think about science policy in this context. Here's another headline in the New York Times. Microwave weapons are prime suspect in, in ills of USA embassy workers. So I'm not sure if you remember this headline, but probably about a year or two ago as well, um, embassy workers in Cuba were getting sick. And they weren't sure exactly why they were getting sick. 
and I think it's some type of microwave weapon that was making them sick. And so there's this whole big science technology policy there, right? There's obviously some science there. How do you make embassy workers sick from afar? That's not an easy problem to have. And of course it has geopolitical issues, right? If all of a sudden your embassy workers are getting sick, you know, that's politics, there's this science involved, and so that's another way you can see science and policy there. And then this is a sad story. The blue bird from Rio is now extinct in the wild. So I don't know if you've seen that movie Rio. There's a small blue bird, now it's actually extinct. So again, um, definitely a science policy question. How do we preserve the, the earth? How do we preserve the animals? Um, what kind of policies do we put in place to make that happen? So those are some things that we used to that study. And different faculty in this department are, deal with these type of issues. And so as I'm looking around, I see heads shaking yes because they, they study these type of questions. Um, kind of another way to look at science policy, there's science for policy and policy for science. On the, um, on the left side for you, the science for policy, this is how can science actually impact policy making? So what's very common, let's say you're a biologist or a physicist, you do some type of experiment and then you'll go to Capitol Hill and say, okay, we need to now fix this, this policy. You know, there are science, scientists who does climate change research, now you can say, okay, my research can be now used in the policy. That's called the science for policy. The other side, policy for science, um, there's lots of different policies involved directing science. So the Congress will actually make laws saying, we're going to fund this much with science, we're going to get, we want you to do this type of research, we're going to put this type of patent laws in place. And there's definitely policies that impact science. And at some point, um, you may be involved in both sides of this type of debate. You know, sometimes you may be a scientist who goes to Capitol Hill or goes to the, the, um, Albany and says, my science can be used to construct better policies. Yeah. And then other times, you may actually have to, as a scientist, be called on to direct the science po policy. And again, I know um, colleagues of, of, of ours do both. So those type of things. And then there's another field the science of science policy. So these are people like myself, who actually are scientists, who then study science policy. It's getting very meta. <laughs> it's kind of the matrix, right? These levels. And so this is actually a director <coughs> within the National Science Foundation that studies science and technology policy. And so some of my research money and grant money comes from the SISA organization to study science and technology policy. So what types of things should we do in order to improve science policy? So who's saying that? what time it is. Let me make sure I don't want to go over time. Okay. A brief history of science policy. Now, obviously, the, well, we have a real historian in the room, so I'm not going to go too much into history of science policy, but this is not a new thing, per se. So if you go back, you know, to ancient history, you know, ancient science policy, there's obviously some science policy building the, the pyramids or some science policy here. Now, we might not think of it as tr traditional science policy, but this was a lot of technology, lots of science going into these things, and this is built for some political reason, right? Obviously, uh, the Pharaoh wants uh, maybe people to worship him or something like that, but this was a science policy issue going on, um, ancient science. Or you have similar things, maybe with the Great Wall or with uh, ancient wave uh, uh, navigators who are trying to move across the ocean. There was some, definitely some science involved, some, maybe some policy issues. Um, the first real science policy as a field to get started was kind of around 1939 to 1945. What was happening in that time period, you know? World War II. World War II. There you go. So, so World War II. Um, and really, science was kind of a champion in World War II. Kind of, science kind of won the war. Um, we talked about the nuclear bomb, talked about these fire jets. And so these dorky, nerdy people were kind of heroes for World War II. And science policy really got a big boost during World War II because it was such an influential part of fighting, fighting the war. And so you may not have seen this person. If you took EST 600 a long time ago, do um, you know who this person is? Van Bar Bush, right? Van Bar Bush. Is, so um, Van Bar Bush wrote this, um, this little letter to the president talking about what to do with all this science and technology after World War II. We developed all these weapons, we developed all these different um, techniques, and, um, operations research, that kind of thing. Does it stay in the military behind closed doors, no one has access to it? Or do you open those doors and have so the whole world uses technology. And Van Bar Bush was really pushing for more open access. He was pushing for the research to get out of the, the bunkers. He was pushing for more education, broader education. And he was pushing for some type of science organization, like to, you know, the National Science Foundation, for example, some type of science, national science organization. So Van Bar Bush was pushing. 
1945. And then, of course, now we get to today. Um, science policy is, you know, very mature. You have things like this. Um, could Ukraine have the next Silicon Valley? Everyone wants to be Silicon Valley. Yeah, Silicon Valley is kind of this, this you know, great place, great example of innovation. Everyone wants to be Silicon Valley. So, you know, can Ukraine be Silicon Valley? Um, Silicon Savannah in Kenya. Can Kenya have the next Silicon Valley? And then, of course, uh, Vietnam, right? So, kind of all of the world, no matter where you go, people are talking about Silicon Valley, becoming innovative, developing technologies. But that's a hard thing to solve. Um, Silicon Valley is a very unique place, right? There's a great university there. Um, there's the, the laws and culture of Silicon Valley. Um, there's nice weather. I mean, it's actually nice to live in California. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to pick that up and move it to, to Ukraine or to Kenya or to Vietnam. Vietnam. That won't happen overnight. But lots of science policy scholars study that topic as well. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about the current landscape of science policy. And then after this, I'll go into my personal study of what I'm doing. So let's look at the current landscape of what's happening. So if you kind of look around the world, um, who's doing the most research and who has the most funding? Um, it's probably the usual suspects. Suspects. So you have, of course, the North America. Um, about 29% of R&D is from North America. A lot of that's from, of course, the USA. If you go to Asia, uh, the Far East Asia, um, lots of science and technology. Um, Japan, China, South Korea, um, really powerhouses in science and technology. And then um, in Africa, South Africa is kind of the, one of the major players in, in, in Africa. Also, Nigeria does lots of science. And then in Latin America, um, Brazil is especially a very pivotal country in science policy as well. We look about spending on R&D. Something called GERD, which is, which is the gross expenditures on R&D. And this is kind of a nice measure of how much is the country spending on their R&D. A lot of countries are kind of around this two and a half, three percent range. Um, a lot of people have tried to figure out why is everyone at this two percent range. Um, there's no real reason. There's no. I mean, there's people have written papers about two percent is a good good level. Why is two percent a good level? We, we kind of make that up, right? but we think it's a good level. And so a lot of countries have this. They want to kind of reach this two percent as a magic level. Some countries have done more. So you can kind of see this um, light blue line. I think that's. Uh, South Korea, we have some South Koreans in the room. So South Korea has really expanded and grown over the past 15, 20 years. And um, South Korea is a great example of a country that really has taken off in terms of technology. I mean, lots of countries go to South Korea to, to, to become more innovative because they kind of they found the secret sauce in South Korea. Um, though a poor country here, this, this little red country here is dropped down. Another country that is, that's Russia, right? So if you look at Russia before the, before the wall fell, you know, 80s and 90s, early 90s, they were really well, and all of a sudden, kind of just they dropped, right? Geopolitical reasons make that happen. Um, you see another country that's very interesting here. You can see it's like a nice yellow country here, China. Over the past 10, 10 15 years, China's grown a lot in science and technology in terms of R&D. Uh, we have some scholars in the room who focus on China, and so if you have a question about that, talk to Gong, right? He's, he's the expert in that. But again, lots of, so you can kind of see the trends in R&D. And the USA is kind of bouncing around. Two and a half percent, up and down, depending on the figure. Um, one thing is also useful to know is how does the USA spend our, spend money? I think we kind of have it. We know money comes in and out, but we don't know the scale. So about two trillion dollars comes from uh, tax taxes. So you, know, you pay your hardworking taxes. About two trillion dollars, and then you have some things like the trust funds, and you have borrowing that comes from other money. But then where does the money go? Um, 2.45 trillion goes to something called we call mandatory spending. This is things like your Social Security, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and those type of things. So a big chunk of what comes into the, um, the government gets spent on mandatory spending. And then a little bit spent, spent on the debt, 200 billion. And then 1.1 trillion is spent on discretionary spending. These are the things that we are getting used to, you know, the roads, the bridges, the government, those type of things. So this is another image kind of showing the breakdown of spending in the USA. Again, you have your mandatory spending. Again, that's, that's Medicare and Social Security. Then you have the discretionary spending, and you have the interest. So those are kind of the three big bins. And then we look at discretionary spending. Um, in the USA, you know, this big chunk here is the military. Right? So I'm not sure if you, if you know that. And this, and this is not a comment whether this is good or bad, but this is just the facts. This the military is basically half the discretionary spending. 
And then we start breaking it down to more subcategories. You have things like government, education, um, benefits, international affairs. And then one small sliver here, about 3%, is science. So again, a small little sliver goes to actual science. When we look inside of this kind of science r and spending, how is it spent? Well, who does, does most work? Um, again, the Department of Defense is a big player in science and technology spending. About half of R&D in the USA is kind of from the DOD. And then HHS, which is basically the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, they're about a, a quarter. And then NASA, DOE, and you can kind of see the smaller slivers here and there. So again, this is, this is relevant for a lot of faculty in the room and people in this room is that um, in terms of funding, the DOD has lots of funding. So when we try to get grants, often the DOD is a big pot of money that we should kind of go out for. And the things like the NSF, which is a much, much, much smaller bin of money for us to get research. Um, there we go. So again, there's lots of different agencies and organizations doing science policy in the USA. We have the executive branch, um, the judicial, the legislative branch. So, um, and as, so at the executive branch, you have something called OSTP, the INS, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. It's run out of the White House. On um, the bureaucracy, so the, N, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, the NSF, kind of all come out of the executive branch. On um, the legislative branch, you know, they are the ones who give the money out. So they're very important in setting the agenda for science and technology policy. Um, you have things like committees and caucuses. So as you make these laws, kind of how it's funneled down, you have the science committees. They kind of sit in a room and talk about what's going on. Um, what's relevant for you especially, on well, these science committees, sometimes they're scientists, but a lot of them are not scientists. So if you go to Congress, you'd be surprised by how few of them actually know what science is all about. And so that's why it's very important for you guys to get involved in science policy. Um, the judicial branch is not as, as active in science policy, but there's a few things that they, they do. So a lot of times these case decisions, they help make case decisions. Um, also, how is science used in, in, um, in court cases? So um, let's take DNA, right? So they're very involved in how does the court use DNA and that, that evidence? And there's a very robust discussion about um, the judiciary and science technology policy in, in science, because they don't have the same framework or approach in science and technology, right? Because you know, what's good enough proof to send someone to jail, right? Versus what a scientist will say. So you know, science is kind of, it can be very probabilistic. You know, nothing's, nothing's very proofed all the time. So, but with, if you're gonna send someone to jail, you wanna have some strong evidence and strong proof. And so sometimes there's clashes of worlds in this system. Uh, who else is involved? You have labor unions, trade groups, think tanks. Um, the news, professional societies, advocacy groups, these are all different people involved in science, technology, policy. All right, so that's kind of my introduction part, right? So that's kind of, so that's, that's EST 600 in like, that's a whole semester's class, a PhD class in 20 minutes, right? So that's all you can know if you take that class in a few years. But, so what I'm talking about with my research project, again, is looking at the broader impact criteria. And so my main question was, how do you assess R&D and how does it impact marginalized groups? And again, marginalized groups is a very broad term, and in the USA it's different than in other countries. But in the USA, a marginalized group could be a, a, poor, a poor group, it could be a um, minority group, and so those kind of marginalized communities in the USA. And so I developed something called the Inclusion and Media criteria, Criterion to assess R&D funding. And then kind of the, ver the main takeaway point is that the NSF funding mostly helps advantage groups, but about a third of the funding benefits marginalized communities as well. So if you fall asleep, just you know, know these two lines, that's all you need to know, right? I'm on time. All right. Plenty of time. So there's something called the um, PPAPG, there's Proposal and Award Policy Guideline. So when you apply to the National Science Foundation, so a little bit, again, since we have professors and non-professors, the National Science Foundation is one of these big science agencies in the USA. Um, you know, it's not the, the biggest, the National Institutes of Health is the biggest, but it's still a very major funder of science in the USA. And they fund things from um, physics to you know, zoology, they fund kind of all the basic science out there. Um, and oftentimes this is where <laughs> professors get research money to do projects. 
whenever you apply to the National Science Foundation, they have this big guideline called the PP or PAPPG, the proposal guideline. And so we have to follow these guidelines in order to write a proposal. The proposal we submit has to be 15 pages long. And whenever you write these grants, you have to talk about two things. One is the intellectual merit of your project, and the other is the broader impact of your project. The intellectual merit is very understandable. You know, what, how does this research you know, improve knowledge development? What, what new discovery are you making? That's the intellectual merit. The broader impact is, you know, this is what they say, the broader impact criteria encompasses the potential benefit to society and to contribute to achievements of specific desire to solid outcomes. So they want to see how your research will have societal outcomes. Now, the reason why I have this is that kind of in the charter of the, of the NSF, they're supposed to kind of benefit the USA, benefit humanity. And so that's kind of built into how they were designed and made. And also in 2010, Congress mandated that the NSF give awards based on the broader impact criteria. So it's kind of built into the sauce of the NSF. Um, and this is important because every now and then, a congressperson who really was a kind of a uh, budget hawk, they'll go through NSF grants and say, is this a waste of money or not? So I think at one point there's something called a, a they're looking at shrimp running. They push a shrimp running on a treadmill. And so a congressperson got really upset thinking it's, it's a waste of money to look at how shrimp run on a treadmill. And you know, it does sound funny. But the reason why, because depending on how, because shrimp are in the water and they get, they're very susceptible to pollution, and so depending on how they respond to different pollutants actually affects how they run or swim. And so it does, it's a funny title, but it has actual relevance to humanity. But if you're not careful, a politician will see that and say, you're just wasting our money. Give it to something else. And so the NSF really emphasizes broader impacts. There's lots of complaints about these broader impacts. Um, one is that's a very vague and ambiguous standard. But again, basically the only guidance you have is this one or two sentences about broader impacts. And so you want to, to judge a whole proposal based on one or two sentences. There's not a lot of information there. Um, for some people, it's says hard to get grants, especially for junior faculty like myself. So if you are a, um, a great scholar, you know, a senior scholar, if you have a full, couple full professors, you have Todd and you have Wolf, right? They have been doing this for a long time, for 20, 30 years. They can write good grants, think lots of good money. And so they have the bandwidth to do broader impacts. As a junior faculty, I'm not as skilled as they are. I just don't have the time to really get these broader impacts. And so if my research is based on broader impacts, they're going to get the grants because they have the, the, the ability to do broader impacts more than I do. Um, there's some philosophical roots wrong with this broader impacts thing. Um, one said you should not judge science based on the broader impacts. Um, you should only focus on intellectual merit. And a classic example is looking at maybe Bohr, you know, Niels Bohr, kind of these early scientists who were developing the, the atoms. They had no clue that the atom would turn into, you know, the atom bomb into electricity and all that kind of stuff. They were just looking at the basic structure of matter. So they had no clue about the broader impacts. But if the government was only funding something with known broader impacts, they would have never been funded to, to do this research. So someone pushed back on that way. Um, the broader impacts models are often based on a flawed linear model. Um, I didn't talk much about the linear model, but this is another thing to learn in some of the classes I teach. Science goes from basic to applied to, you know, broader impacts, kind of step-by-step -step process. Science doesn't quite work that way. There's these loops and these feedback loops, and it's not just one nice straight process. And so often this broader impact model is based on this idea that, you know, you do some research, develop it, and it comes out to broader impacts. It doesn't quite happen that that way. Um, peer review is a bad way to assess the value. So it, also for background sake, so whenever you apply to National Science Foundation, it's the way that grants are determined whether you give money or not is based on peer review. What peer review is, is basically what happens is that science, a group of scientists, let's say 15, 20 scientists, will get into a room together and then they'll discuss the pros and cons of each of the grants. And the ones that are the best grants get funded, the ones that are not the best grants do not get funded. So that's kind of the peer review process. And that's a kind of a core way that science is judged um, um, nowadays. And so whenever you apply, for, whenever you um, submit an article for a journal, it's peer reviewed. And whenever you apply for money, it's also in this peer review process. So. Now, the reason why this could be a bad way to assess broader impacts is that when you're sitting in these rooms for peer review, no one's an expert on broader impacts. 
everyone's an expert in pure science or physics or mathematics or biology, right? They're experts in their fields, but they're not experts in broader impacts. And so we're asking scientists who are not experts in broader impacts to judge a grant based on the broader impacts. So it's not the most efficient way to judge science. That's another complaint. And finally, someone says, it's just an inefficient use of money. If you really want to fund broader impacts, fund a project that does broader impacts. Fund a project that does K-12 outreach. Right? So as opposed to having a physicist do a high energy physics experiment and then go off and talk to a K-12 class about their science, just fund a person to do K-12 outreach. As opposed to asking a scientist who doesn't know how to talk to students anyway to go talk to high school students. So that's another complaint. So I can't address all of these different things, um, but we'll see what, how much of these I can, can address in the next few minutes. So what this chart is, this is often how broader impacts are currently judged. There's about eight different categories. You have things like infrastructure for science, and so you know, let's say you're a scientist who creates a new type of data set or a new type of microscope. That's called infrastructure for science, you can share that. Uh, broadening participation, uh, going, doing recruiting for underrepresented minority groups, that's broader participation. Uh, training and education, uh, mentoring graduate students, undergrad students, and so forth. This is very common. In most of the grants we apply for, part of the grant actually funds, under, uh, uh, funds graduate students. And as you know, there's some, several grad students in the room. Grad students are kind of the engine of science. They kind of make things work around here. And so without grad students, very low could get done. Uh, Collaboration, so let's say I collaborate with someone in um, um, Nigeria or Germany, with collaboration. K-12 outreach, potential style benefits. Does this research directly inform policy issues? We also do um, broad dissemination, um, reaching a non-academic audience. So let's say you do some type of project and you develop maybe a website or some type of podcast or you know special newspaper, that could be broad outreach. I mean, partnership, partnering with potential users, whether it's industry or nonprofit organizations, these are the main categories for growing us. Yeah. Just a quick question, Adam. Is, is this um, how people have interpreted that instruction, or this is the NSF saying, think of it in at least these eight ways? Um, a little bit of both. The NSF has been vague on purpose because they don't want yeah, people just to follow these eight categories. But they do, but they, on their guidelines, they kind of give examples, and their examples do follow these, these eight things. I see. But they've, been, they are vague on purpose. Question. Oh yeah, no, no, good point. If you have questions as I go along, feel free to stop me. This is, in my sense, it's you know, more informal, right? So if you want to stop with questions, um, please do that. No, no problem. So this was studied by Roberts, uh, Melanie Roberts, in 2009, and she used those different categories and analyzed the different directors and how they kind of line up in these different areas. And so the most common one is training. So um, Across the, uh, the top, you have Bio, CSE, Engineering, Geo, MPS, OPP, and SBE. These are the different directorates within the NSF. So in the NSF, they have different subfields. Sub and so Bio is just that, biological research. Uh, CSC is, I think, uh, computer science research. Engineering is other engineering, so you know, mechanical, civil. Geo is geology. MPS is mathematical, physical sciences. OPP is, I don't know what OPP is. Yeah. SBE is social behavioral economics. So I tend to fall into this SBE category because I do lots of um, policy stuff. But these are different directorates. Again, how it lines up again. Training and education, by far the most common. And then you have some of the other ones scattered about. Infrastructure for science and so forth. Okay. Uh, there's another study done by the National Science Foundation Board, the NSB. The NSB is basically the governing body of the National Science Foundation, so kind of the board of directors of the NSI. And they did a study looking at 100,000 grants, so they looked at the whole, you know, basically the whole corpus of NSF grants. And they did some type of machine learning process with they analyzed, kind of categorized them. And they said about 60% of the grants were for teaching and learning, <laughs> and about 25% were providing participation. Those are the data. So I have two questions related to these things that previous people haven't studied. One, are how are broader impacts integrated into the research? And so people sometimes propose these broader impacts, but we're not sure whether these things are additions to the research, like you know, you're a physicist and then you go out and do K-12 ed education. 
that is not linked to your underlying research, or the broader impacts directly related to the underlying research. So I'm actually studying the integration of broader impacts in the research. And then the other question, how does NFF, NSF funding impact poor and marginalized groups? So these categories from before, um, these are good groups, good groupings, but it's not quite sure clear how marginalized communities are impacted by this research. Some are more clear, so let's say you have um, broadening participation. That may be more clear that's impacting marginalized groups, but you know, um, partnership with potential users, depending on the, the, the research a lot or what they're doing, this could help marginalized groups or could not. Partnering with industry, I mean, if um, a, an EE professor partners with Sony to develop a better um, computer, it, it's good research, but maybe not helping marginalized groups. Or, if, you know, in academic collaboration, if I partner with a, a researcher in Germany, that's not going to help marginalized groups per se. So, great ideas, but just we don't understand who will benefit from this research. So that's why I, I care about. So I developed something called the immediacy inclusion criteria. And so this is something one of my students, we had, we had long discussions. Should I call it the Woodson criteria? Or you know, put my name on something and say this is the Woodson criteria. But I decide between, right for now at least, the immediacy inclusion criteria. You know, I won't say it's a Woodson criteria, but at some point I may call it that. <laughs> Um, so there's three three levels to it. There's a it's a three by three grid. So one dimension is called the immediacy, and so it's, there's three levels: direct, extrinsic, intrinsic. And I got this from actually from another paper by Jacobson. They're the first ones to kind of bring up this idea of immediacy. And so I was like, okay, this is a good idea. So I'll 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 take it, borrow it, and then I'll develop it. And again, this is this is interesting to the inherent nature of the research, the inherent nature of the broader impacts. That's what's going on here. Next, and so there's again three levels. The first level is intrinsic. This means that the broader impacts are central to the research itself. And here's a picture of something called the malaria vaccine. So if you're a researcher developing a malaria vaccine, the research itself and the broader impacts themselves go hand in hand, right? I mean, it's very clear, malaria vaccine has broader impact that helps the world. Very closely linked. Direct. The broader impacts that are achieved while conducting the research. So the, the classic example of this is training students. For most grants, training students is not the goal of the research project. But in order to do the research project, you have to train the students. So you get the broader impact along the way. It's directly related, but it's not the goal of the research project. And finally, extrinsic. These are the broader impacts that, have, that are not related to the underlying research. So the, the broader impacts are completely separate from the research itself. And the, uh, let's say this is a little classroom. So again, if um, I pick a ton just right there, so if Tan just decides to go out and uh, he's sleeping, so I, that's how I'm picking on him. <laughs> so if Tan just decides to go off with his with his um, um, his current project on, on wastewater on waste, if he then decides to go off and teach K through 12 education, that waste his research on waste has really nothing to do with K through 12 education. So those are separated from each other. Right? So that's that's what this. Uh, the, the second dimension is called inclusivity. They have three levels. You have universal, inclusive, and advanced status quo. Let me just do a quick time check. I have to rely on the students to help me out. It's 1.45, right? Okay. I'm going to move a little quicker now because I want to run out of time. So three levels. Let me go through these three levels quickly. and then we'll, So the first universal. It helps everyone regardless of who, if you try or not. So. Um, yeah, the BIA helps everyone regardless of status. And a classic example of this would be the smart grid. If um, a scientist is developing a better smart grid that makes cleaner energy, whether you're rich or poor, you benefit from a smart grid. So that's kind of universal. Advantage or status quo. Um, these are broader impact activities that help advantage groups or at least just maintain the status quo. So some, a lot of research, you know, let's say you're developing a new supercomputer. It will mostly help advantage groups, or if nothing else, just maintain the status quo. I'm not saying this is bad research to do. There's, there's, there's benefit to having research that benefits the advantage status quo, but let's just be honest about that, that who's, who benefits from that. Um, also, lots of defense research, you know, the Department of Defense, whenever they do research, their explicit goal is to actually create inequality, right? So if you were trying to develop the newest fire jet, the goal is that 
your fire jet is better than the other person's fire jet. You want to actually increase inequality. So that is actually kind of built into a lot of defense research. So again, there's value in creating a new fire jet, but let's not, but it's going to kind of increase inequality. So we should be honest about that. But that's what you're doing. Um, but there's some research that's inclusive, that's actually designed to help marginalized groups. So, you know, and again, the point, the malaria vaccine could be an example of something, something like that, where it's designed to target and help marginalized groups. So with that said, I built this nice three by three grid. You have, you know, universal advantage status quo and inclusive on the one dimension, and you have intrinsic, direct, extrinsic in the columns. So you have nine cells, and then we can actually do some analysis of these nine cells. For my study here, I'm looking at nanotechnology. Um, over the past five or six years, I'm doing a lot of work with nanotechnology. But as you get down to the atomic scale, matter behaves differently. It can make lots of new products because you're doing things at the atomic scale. So a hair is about 80,000 nanometers, and DNA is about 2.5 nanometers. And so with nanotechnology, it's traditionally between 1 and 100 nanometers. So very, very, very small. So, so what we did, we, we uh, basically mined the NSF website, they have an open portal with all their grants. You can download their grants and then analyze them. So this, a lot of this work was done with a student um, about two summers ago, uh, an undergrad student I worked with, and she did a lot of uh, the coding. So we, we downloaded the grants and read them. Um, some, of the, some, of the, some of the technical stuff we use RQDA. The software we use is R, if you're, if you're interested. It's open source software. Within R, there's something called RQDA, which is kind of a qualitative data analysis tool. So if you want more information about that. So what you're looking at is the project summary that it's that is publicly available? Mm -hmm. okay. yes, you're, you're not actually looking at the proposals, because we you don't have access. Yeah, exactly. Good good, good point. These are the um, project abstracts. The, the NSF will not give me the raw, real project summaries, the 15 page summaries. I've asked, they won't give it to me. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's basically because of privacy issues. It's, yeah. it's against the law, so. Oh, so this, this is an example of what I'm analyzing. So this is a grant by Donna Ginther. Um, you know, she talks about what her science is. And then most grants at some point have something called broader impacts. They actually kind of separate it out and talk about it explicitly. And so we read the whole grants, but a lot of our time and attention is spent on this broader impact section. We actually code that. And so, and for this study, we actually only analyzed uh, yeah, 300 grants, 300 uh, nanotechnology grants, so a small, a, a small sample. And when we look at those, we can kind of, you know, she spent all summer doing this, and we kind of classify it. And, you know, advantages direct, 224, that's the most common category. And then you have some other ones, you know, universal, intrinsic, and so forth. Because of time, I'm not going to read all nine cells, because we don't have time to go through all nine. I'll go through the top cells. We'll discuss those. So this first cell, universal intrinsic, 163 out of 300. So these are things like maybe a carbon capture and storage, a smart grid system. In this grant, the person talks about um, developing a robust advanced combustion engines, better calorie converters, so maybe some type of environmentally friendly car, car process. So that was what happened there, example. Moving on to another one. So this is another big one. Universal extrinsic, um, 108 out of 300. These are things like K through 12 curriculums or maybe partnering with museums. In, the, in my example, they were doing some type of partnership with the Chicago Museum of Science. So they did a research project and then you go to a museum of science and talk to students. And go there. So it's extrinsic to the research, but it's um, kind of universal. Everyone who goes to the museum should have access to this, whatever they're doing there. So we call it universal. Advantage direct, the most common category, 224 out of 300. Um, this is mostly training grad students. This is kind of by far what the people were talking about. Um, and, the reason, and so the reason why I have it is direct, again, because training grad students is not the main goal of the grant, but you get to it along the way. And the reason why we say advantage, in general, grad students are part of an advantage group. I know you don't feel advantage now, but uh, oftentimes graduate students come from parents who are also graduate students who have that type of background, or you were top students in, in undergrad and to, or top students in high school, so oftentimes graduate students are an advantage group. And I remember when I was a grad student, they said I was temporarily poor, right? You are poor now, but one day, hopefully when you become a professor, you'll make lots of money and be a millionaire. Um, 
inclusive direct, 102 out of 300. This is a lot about diversifying STEM. So most of the grants are saying we're going to recruit women or minorities to um, research positions. That's a very common way to talk about this category. And let's see. Yeah, so those are the, 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 uh, the categories. Again, this is a nice little image of all of them together. I also examined how do these categories, the Woodson categories, fit with the old categories. So these are the old categories. And so then we can look at, okay, how do the Woodson categories on the left side match up with the, the uh, Roberts categories on the right-hand side? And you can see some of the things are highly related to each other. So advantage of direct and training education, those go hand in hand pretty closely. Universal intrinsic matches with potential societal benefits and so forth. So some challenges we had. Um, some of the things were hard to code. So creating a video game, where does that fit in this table? Is creating a video game, is that um, advantage? Is it um, so who, who gets benefits from this, creating a video game? Also, there's one group that's saying they're speaking at a retirement community. So in one sense, a retirement community, they already are a marginalized community. Right? They all have access to different things, they may be more sick, and, and so forth. But yet, re retirement communities, some communities are actually very exclusive. And so you can spend $5,000, $10,000 a month at these retirement communities. And so we actually went into, we looked up this grant and, see, and found what retirement community were they talking about? We found out it was actually one of those exclusive retirement communities that cost $10,000 a month. And so we're like, well, this is not a marginalized group, right? Even though they're an elderly population, it's more of an advantaged group. And so we actually marked it as advantage. But again, that's a challenge to who is benefiting from the research. Also, much of the research has what we would call without details. And this is a good example. The project-related activities will expand the curriculum and cutting edge opportunities in material science and engineering with significant inclusion of underrepresented underrepresented students. So they say all this stuff, and then at the end they say, we're going to have underrepresented students. Then we'll say how they're going to do it. They're going to say, they'll talk about recruitment. They just say they're going to do it. And a lot of the grants come at the very end of the paper. At the end of the grant, they'll say, we're doing all these things. Oh, yes, and by the way, we're going to recruit minority students. And so it's inclusive in one sense, but they have, they, it's not clear if they're actually going to do it or how they're going to actually do that goal. So that's another challenge. So kind of for the conclusions. Um, so most of the NSF funding goes to helping advantaged groups. If you go back to one of these charts here, you know, most of it goes to advantaged groups, 235 out of 300. But you know, about a third, you know, 100 out of 300 are inclusive. And then another um, thing is that most of the broader impacts are directly related to research, and then next comes intrinsically related. So um, going back to this, my chart, Direct related, it's kind of the most common category. It's not the main purpose of the research, but you get to it along the way. But there's a, a good chunk that's intrinsic to the actual research itself. And not very much that's, you know, there's some that's extrinsic. And the reason why this is an important finding is that one complaint about the NSF broader impacts was, again, that the broader impacts has nothing to do with the research itself. And we're finding that's not quite the case. Actually, the broader impacts are somewhat related to the research itself. It's not like people doing research, then going to talk to high school students and it's all good. Right. Actually, there is some relationship between yeah. broader impacts and the underlying research. So next steps. Uh, more fields, more grants, and more agencies. So um, I got a grant, it was Wolf of Sangs, um, to, to expand the study. And so we want to do more fields. This was just nanotechnology. My goal is to expand this across the NSF to all the fields in NSF. Also get more grants. This was only five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you, Steve. Good. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, more grants. We, we want to do um, not just 300, but you know, say 1,000. And eventually, we want to actually have a machine learning process. So can we automatically categorize these different things? And so that's the next step as well. And finally, more agencies. This was just the NSF. What would happen if we talk about the NIH? Again, it's a bigger agency. We're even expanding that to the DOD. So this is kind of expanding outwards. And so that's kind of some future steps as well. Uh, questions? So, so this is really interesting. Once you start expanding into these different fields, you imagine uh, doing a correlation and seeing 
uh, are there particular agencies uh, or, or subdivisions within NSF that are exactly, exactly. funding more of this type or that type? That's exactly the goal. So and you can imagine that some fields, I'll pick on a, um, let's say pure mathematics. I mean, maybe pure mathematics is the way the field itself may be Maybe not have as many broader impacts as opposed to um, you know, people who are maybe in economics or um, psychology or something like that. They maybe have more broader impacts, right? So just the field itself may be different. So I'm, I'm interested in that. And of course, the different agencies and how they approach the topic. The NIH, because it focuses on medical research, they may have broader impacts kind of baked into the sauce as opposed to other fields. Uh, very interesting. Uh, one, one question is. Do you observe these temper changes of the time, or will that be something you are interested in? Yeah, so for this grant, we didn't do, really do time series as much. We did 2013 and 17, but it was all kind of lumped together. We can't go back too far in time, because before 2013, um, the NSF guidelines weren't the same, and so it does depend on how far back we go. Um, but it will be interesting to see, okay, before, these, before this policy was put in place, what are broader impacts? We'll talk about broader impacts, and if not, why? And the, the whole point of the science policy was to change what people did. And so it'll be interesting to see if this science policy came in place and did it actually change how people approach the science, which is kind of the goal of what this NSF wanted. They want to change research. Does that, does that happen? So we can try to do that too. Is there things like in this research that you're doing, like things that are involved in? You know why the system is kind of structured like this, like like historically, like what policies have taken place to like kind of make it that like mostly advantaged groups like have benefits to this. Yeah, good, I, I like the question a lot. So um, this 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 question is that one of the policies again, the policy of having NSF directing scholars to do broader impacts. Some of the other studies I do care about what structures and laws does the country put in place that create inequality create these type of things. And so a good example would be the patent restriction, the patent laws. In one sense, we like the way patent laws are, but it could be, you know, it could actually increase inequality. Because right now, right now when if, you're, if you're a research scientist at a university, if you get funding from the government and you patent it, the university owns that IP. And so that kind of, kind of trickles down to the, to the faculty member. As opposed to, if the, universe, if the government gives you money as a researcher, the government owns the IP. So that's something called the Bayh-Dole Act. So again, it's a science policy thing, but who owns the IP from the federally funded research? It's owned by the universities, not by the government. Well, in one sense, that's kind of privatizing public R&D money, right? Because so all of a sudden, it was owned by the government, now it's owned by the universities, and it's kind of, and the universities let that be owned by the professors as well. So it's kind of changing the inequality aspect. So I'm, I'm working on that question right there. Um, I really enjoyed this. I really appreciated the, the depth of information from the beginning of like the overarching down to the specific of the research. Uh, my question um, is uh, information that you provided in the beginning of the slide. That it was that chart. It happened in slide 25. We don't necessarily have to go yeah. through it, but it was the trend lines. Mm -hmm. And so the U.S. is around like 2.5 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any? Um, um, and this may be outside of your range, but uh, what you study. But um, do you know why we're at 2.5? And could there be something, since we haven't really tapped into, we're starting to um, promote legislation where we have a diverse um, set of people working on solving problems, which research shows that that's the best way to you know, emerge, where we have really good ideas emerge on how to solve problems. So um, we're at 2.5%. Is there anything about your research that um, suggests that we can move that in a higher direction? Yeah. Um, this current study doesn't directly address that question. I think that it is a challenging question. What is this optimal level? Um, in some people's minds, more is better, right? So I think, you know, let's take, I'll pick on South Korea. So we have some South Korean friends in the room. Um, they've obviously kind of adopted that strategy, just invest more. Now they're at, what's it, 4%, 4.5%. Um, is that a good use of money? Is, is, are they oversaturating the market? You know, we just don't quite know that. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of ways we can even test that. Maybe you can look at, you can look at publication rates. You know, that's one way of testing research output. The more money you get in, the more publications that come out, does that mean you're more innovative? Well, the more money you put in, the more companies that come out. Is that a way to measure it? So scholars are trying to measure those relationships. And I think a few 
um, people in this room, that's kind of the research question, right? How do you actually increase innovation in these countries? Is it money? Is it the patent laws? Is it some other things? Um, but yeah, we're not. That is that is, that that question you asked is the that is the question. <laughs> that answer. It's um, two comments. One on that last point. I thought you were pretty persuasive before that just the fact that it's remained so constant suggests it's really science politics and not science policy. Yeah. Because you just wouldn't expect over such a broad range of, eco of economies and mm -hmm. socio-political context that that number would have stayed so close. Mm -hmm. The um, I guess the question or, um, sorry, and I want to give an example. The um, I guess what I'm wondering is it seems that in this inclusion criteria there's a certain hubris, mm -hmm. which is that people are going to be able to anticipate the impacts that things have. And I'm wondering how much your research is simply rewarding, and I understand why you're contingent on the forecasting, but let me give you an example. Um, so let's say I propose to you a study, and I'm going to come up with a brand new formula, and it's going to be a formula that's, I'm choosing this for a reason, which I think is going to become clear to you quickly, but it's going to be, um, you know, it will prevent malaria, it will be readily available, it will be shelf stable, and by the way, I'm going to distribute across Africa free of charge. Um, you would reward me for that mm -hmm. because the technology is inclusive and so on and so on. Yet, if we go back to Nestle's fiasco in Africa and transitioning African women off formula that relied on water that was contaminated and, by the way, added a household expense to something which for centuries <laughs> had been, you know, so I guess what I'm wondering is, is it really social impacts or is it anticipated positive social impacts? Mm -hmm. And could you ever imagine a way that NSF could truly be looking at negative impacts? Because, I mean, another example would be lead. You know, I say I'm going to come up with a new paint. And by the way, it's going to be cheaper, last longer, and it's going to be great for urban context. Because, yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, a generation later, you have communities getting hit by lead poisoning. So, so how do we move this inclusion criteria so it's... Yeah, I mean, I, I like those questions. I wish I had answered all, this, all the questions. I yeah, think, no, no, it's yeah. just some and, 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 It's a challenge you have. So when the NSF is trying to, it kind of gets back to some of these core, core, um, core um, let's see if I thought those core roots of these problems of why, how can you do this? Like, how can you understand the broader impacts? Like, I think it's, like you said, it's hard to understand the broader impacts in the first place. So as a scientist who's proposing a project, right. how do you know your broader impacts yet? I mean, you don't know a lot of times. But yet, the challenge is that the, the Congress, in, in, their, in their wisdom, have said, you got to do it. Right? So they've said, 2010, you have to have these things. How do we best do it? So that, that is a challenge we face. So, but there it was. It's to benefit society. Yeah. So yeah. The, the assumption is positive. But exactly. So is it, it's a positive bias. And they're not capturing the negative biases which are against technology as well. Right? And so this is kind of this technology assessment issue. So how do you assess technology as it's being developed? And, Done, so. It's complex, right? You have to start somewhere, and because if it was if it was easy, we already done that. Right? So, um, it's a multiple factors. Herman, that's something. Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, you may have mentioned it, but I'm sorry if I missed it. So, um, my question is about technical things. So you you mentioned you use R. In order to uh, you know analyze, so I was wondering like how many researchers were involved in classify uh, the broader impacts, and also like uh, did you like do manual coding or you use any like machine learning or something to classify the words in the abstracts? Yeah, so for this project, it was used. Um, one main researcher, she was an undergrad student. She did most of the classifying. Right. I also classified it. And we did something called intercoder reliability. Mm. So we checked the accuracy of her coding and my coding to make sure we're all on the same level. Also in the past, I've had other students working on similar, similar projects, some of the PhD students I've worked with. We've done similar things in intercoder reliability. So uh, for example, Francesco's on a different project, similar, but a little different. We also did some intercoder reliability and stuff like that. So that's that question. Um, it was mainly coding it, so we actually read these things and okay. coded it by hand. Right. RQDA, the software, it's very similar to in vivo. I'm not sure if you've heard of in vivo. Somebody's checking your head yes. Or, um, but that's a software that's designed for qualitative data analysis. The reason why I like RQDA is that it's free. In vivo may be like $1,000 or something. Like that. So um, it's similar to in vivo. It has a few less functionality. And so 
For example, in Viva can do video. If you want to code videos and like, look at videos and wow. notate how it's being done, this doesn't quite have video. It's $200 for students. Oh, $200 for students? For students, yeah. For students, I guess, yeah. So I, that's why I went the R route, just because it's free. I think Raphael, you have Yeah, I have the same a similar question. Um, it looks like you, you expanded now. So my question to you is, I mean, let's say I read a broader impact, something that might, might appear as equal to me, like different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how you, um, I mean, how are you going to incorporate domain knowledge and then diversity in terms of, um, I mean, moving forward? Yeah, have you thought about that? That's a, that's a challenge, especially if, you, if I start thinking about cross countries, because what's marginalized in USA is not marginalized in. Um, um, I think I think you're from Ghana, correct? Yeah. Right. So in Ghana, in terms of diversity in STEM, they have a very different field than diversity in STEM in the USA. So, in one sense, this is, could be limited to the USA context, but maybe if you change the definition of looking at marginalized, using that term marginalized as opposed to the only um, low income or only. You know, black and white, blacks and females, that, could, that allows us to be somewhat broader because each community does have its own marginalized group. So that could help with that question. Yeah, I have a follow up to that. So, in terms of um, um, evaluating mm -hmm. like code, do you have a scale that you say, okay, um, let's say um, equality has a scale of, um, I'm evaluating it on a scale of, say, one to five, or is just a yes or a no? This is a yes or no, okay. and we, but we do have a small check about um, quality in the sense of, with and without details. And again, I told you at the very end, there's some that have very little information about what's going on. They just say, at the very end, come as a, as a last line, and we're going to recruit a diverse student, whatever else. Those are saying, yes, you're inclusive, but you're without details. And there's some that are inclusive with, they can say, we're going to recruit students from this high school in this community, and we're going to do all these different things, and that's inclusive and you know, give them details. So that's kind of that check step of quality. I want, I mean, what, what, it's very compelling in terms of uh, developing an analytical tool. Yeah. Uh, intrinsic, extrinsic, inclusive, etc. Um, but going a step further, I would like to know how successful are actually these projects in what they promise. Yeah. So you come now, you have now the tool, and you get, let's say, all the NSF cons are coded and analyzed, and then you get your three by three chart and the numbers in it, and you know uh, this is basically the landscape which they populate. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, if I imagine I am NSF I, or I am society, whatever, I want to know can this now lend itself to assess if it's just. Yes, I mean that they have yeah. promises, right? Or is it something that actually made a difference in the real world? Yeah. So is, isn't, it needn't be your ultimate goal to reach that determination? Yeah, so um, a part of my good point, part of my next project is actually looking at the um, output, publication output from these grants. So there's actually, um, we can do two things. This study was looking at the abstracts of the grants. When you first submit a grant, you have an abstract. And then at the end of the grant, you have the project outcome reports. And so for my grant that I'm working on now, we're going to actually analyze the project outcome reports and say, OK, what you actually did from this abstract. And that's also tied with the number of publications associated with the grant. And so publications are not the best proxy for scientific success, but it's often a proxy that we use for scientific research. So the theory is that. The more successful a research project is, the more publications it has coming out. Some people are, can argue with me about whether that's a good proxy, but that's often what we use. And so I want to analyze actually the number of publications associated with different broader impacts. And say, so, okay, this grant had these broader impacts, and it ha came out with 10 publications. This grant only had these broader impacts, and only had two publications. And is there some correlation between broader impacts and output? And also correlation between broader impacts and in the POR, the outcome reports, to discuss it. See, Tom just is anxious to push back. All right, go for yeah, it. Yeah, because so 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 I. What you're doing is you're rewarding a grant writer who knows how to talk the talk. Mm -hmm. So 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 um, someone who who wants to develop a malaria vaccine, but they're inept, and and so they don't 
spell out well what the what the broader impacts are is is penalized as com in comparison to someone who say wants to build more prisons and 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 writes it in such a clever way that they're going to be inclusive and 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 and, 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 and yeah. The the and and the person who writes the the prison grant may may break his study down and and produce twenty five papers, uh, whereas the person who writes the malaria vaccine writes one paper, but but saves a million people a year. Yeah. Um, so I I don't you know proxies are are, are, are interesting yeah. things you know and 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 predictions. The, the other thing is, is making predictions is, is sometimes a fraught process itself. Um, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily know what's going to result from, from uh, you know, what was Pasteur originally studying. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't um, he wasn't trying to make, make uh, antibiotics. That's true, yeah. But if you know the limitations, right, of using, of using publications as a, as a proxy, can't you just discuss but that's got nothing uh, to do with the impact, the broader impact. But you can still measure some of the broader impact from those publications, not for the wide breadth of... How? How? By, by account. So I have 12 publications versus three. What is that? What is, in, how does that... The content in, you know, are they peer-reviewed? What is the, um, what, what has been measured? What are... Well, they're all peer-reviewed. They're all... You, you didn't talk about what their content, you, you just want yeah. to count them. So yeah, so this is an issue, so how do you, how do you if you're looking at, in terms of the output coming out, right, so the publications, right, so it's a, that, that, that could be the, my, the question, the research question is, are the... You're looking at the content of the publications. Uh, for, right? for, for, the, for, for this part, a second part of the project, I'll see. So this is, let's, let's, this is my, my nice chart, right, so, um, so let's say the grants, once we have student training, they produce, on average, 10 publications, and ones that are K-12, on average, produce two publications. My theory, my thought behind it would be that because things, broad impacts that are intrinsic or direct, it's kind of useful for your research. It's kind of incorporated into your research. Things that are extrinsic have nothing to do with your research, and so you have to spend more time and energy doing these, these activities. And there is some studies that say, if, you know, when you become a, a department chair, your productivity goes down because you no longer can do all your research. You have to you know, deal with people like me, right? That takes time for his day. Um, but not me. I'm a good person. <laughs> but, but for, for David Tonjes, though, he takes time out of the day. And mm -hmm. so all of a sudden, productivity drops. And so there is some research saying that depending on doing things that are extrinsic to your research will reduce your productivity. I'm trying to see is that the same case with Bart impacts as well, where extrinsic Bart impacts reduce your academic productivity measured by research grants. Now, the challenge with that, I think Tom is a good point, is that if you're doing lots of broader impacts, some of your, your you may not be producing grants, which is okay, maybe saving the world. So you can't measure saving the world from, you know, how do you measure that? You know, that's, that's a hard thing to measure. If you actually solve the problem, so there's no need to write a paper, you yeah. know, the, or, or you write one paper, yeah. that you don't have, you don't have an, your lab shuts down and, and, and so you write one paper. Yeah. Or, you, or you work with the UN, and you have a UN study. That's not traditional publication, so it, does, it is a, a b poor proxy. I'll Partial. Part, yeah. So. But how about the quality of the journal? I think it should yeah. have. So we definitely can do that. We, can, we, can, we could um, normalize it based on citations. So this may have you know, 10 publications on average in each publication on average gets 100 citations. This may have two on average, and each cite publication has on average two citations. So more citations equals better quality in one sense. Um, and then by the journal, so we can do some normalization checks to make sure it's actually quality. Yeah. But you would also probably want to step out the academic publication context, because broader impact target society, yeah. so are there TV uh, programs about it, are there newspaper reports about it, true. and so on and so forth. I mean, how much penetrates or finding some kind of criterion that allows you to realize that it leaves the academic confined yeah. and gets discussed in society, that's, that's I would say, is... Yeah. 
And to that point, there, there are some new, you're giving me some great ideas, everyone's. Um, there's something called alt metrics that actually kind of measures, tries to measure that, like, is my article tweeted? Is it, does it appear in some type of journal, in um, the CNN? So alt metrics tries to measure that, that point there. So I probably should tell some new ones with that. And there's also a lot of qualitative methods, yeah. um, creative ones that you can use. I've, I've seen people where they've um, collected all of these. So this is different research. Um, they've collected the uh, emails of specific um, uh, professors in a, in a given field across the country and then um, sent them like you know, questionnaires, specific questionnaires. So you only you get a really low response rate, but if you have a really large email set, and you can still capture some so interviews, um, observations, there's a whole breadth of things in qualitative. You, you know, the pushback against against the broader impacts notion is is that very basic research may not have an obvious societal impact. And, and so, you know, when Carrie Mullis is, is sitting around thinking about how can I replicate DNA, he's not thinking, oh, okay, this is going to lead to, to uh, an entire new tech, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know, technology that's going to change the nature of medicine and, and, and the way we look at history and, and all sorts of interesting stuff like that. He's just, he's interested in a technical problem. And, and if you don't fund him because he can't adequately express, well, this is, this is going to lead to, right. but you I mean, know, there, things there, that... There is a lot of work that, that could, I mean, give more clarity to that because that's the traditional distinction between fundamental research and applied research in a way. So the, 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 the ideology of fundamental research always is you don't know what's going to be the effect of it and the usefulness of it, but it's useful in itself as poor as it is because it is unpredictable and then come all the historical examples where something came out of unpredictable, very limited research. But historically, it's also, this is a very new development. So in, from my point of view, looking at it historically, I see that the NSF now, which is traditionally funding basic research, is now opening up more to applied research right. and also opening up to the societal consequences of research. So in a way, they are, it's beginning to be understood that even the most, not the most, there's still a lot, but that, that the focus is now on getting closer to understanding what are the societal consequences. That's a is consequences. That's a shift in the whole attitude. Well, it was a pushback by the Republican Congress against pointy-headed scientists just studying what they wanted instead of doing what, what was going to contribute to yeah, the this national is, this is absolutely true. industry. When you have these numbers, the, 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 the dollar amounts, mm -hmm. Is this only uh, federal funding, or does that include the industry as well? Um, I mean, I industry research. Industry. Yeah, this is just federal funding. So this, this yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, that's another that's that's uh, another element that is completely out there yeah. in a way. That I mean, companies like Alphabet or so, uh, the 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 dean recently came back and was telling the chairs that Google says, don't educate computer scientists, we do that better than you, bring more diversity to the field. I mean, so it's interesting, they are so, I mean, they are so wealthy in terms of what the, what the industry can do, that at some point, just to, to get the, the proportions right, I think it's also important to look into how much private yeah. Uh, funding of research is going on as opposed to, uh, and that also in different nations, as opposed to uh, governmental funding. Because the governmental funding always has your Republican or whatever uh, politicians saying this is tax money, it needs yeah. to be accounted for, therefore it should have a broader social impact and so on and so forth. But anyway, t our time is up. I want to thank you for coming and discussing this. I want to thank you for creating an inspired discussion. And uh, and it's it's I mean 
It shows that we are tackling problems where we don't have the answers, but questions too. Huh? That sounds right. No? Let's continue. Here, everyone, talk more. I'm always around, so questions, feel free to stop by and have a question about it.